Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Wojtek Rapak. Um, uh, I am um, one of the conveners um, uh, of the seminar for uh, Puna, uh, Polski Uniwersytet na Obczyźnie, uh, Polish University Abroad. Um, and um, I'll just say just something extremely briefly about the, 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 the institution itself. It's uh, been around for about 80 years. It was established uh, by, um, let's call them refugee Polish academics in 1939 and has gone through um, a, a very exciting history, uh, which basically reflects what's uh, been happening in Poland since 1939. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure uh, to welcome um, Robert uh, Hampson, Professor Robert Hampson, who's going to be talking to us about uh, in, uh, Joseph Konrad, Józef Konrad Kozaniowski, um, and um, uh, I'm sure that uh, most of you know um, uh, his um, his oeuvre, as it were, and his uh, his his work on on, on Conrad. Um, and uh, I won't uh, won't dwell any more on the introduction, and I'll just pass the uh, pass the baton to uh, to Robert. Robert, please, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wojtek. I'm just going to see, sorry, I'm trying to see how, whether these things move. Okay, um, I'm afraid there's eight sections this talk. So, A Boy's Daydreams in Darkest Africa, Annexing Malaysia, An Outpost of Progress, Kyat and Carlier, Mr. and Mrs. Price, Heart of Darkness, and then a very short conclusion. Um, what I want to do is begin at the beginning, or rather, I want to begin with several beginnings. I want to start with Josef Konrad Kozanyowski in 1889. In March 1889, he gives up command of the Otago, his first command at Port Adelaide in Australia, having safely delivered a cargo of wheat from Melbourne and returns to London. In July, he's released from the status of Russian subject as officially gazetted. In the autumn, he sits down in his rented rooms in Pimlico and begins to write a story that turns into his first novel, Almeida's Folly. Now that he's no longer a Russian subject, he also begins to plan his first visit to Poland since 1874 when he'd left for Marseille to begin his sea career. And in November, he goes to Brussels to be interviewed by the Société Anonyme Belge um, for the commerce in the Congo for the post of captain and one of their steamers on the Congo. 1889 then was quite an eventful year with new rooms, the start of a new career as a novelist, his first visit to Poland as an adult and an interview for a new job in a part of the world that had always fascinated him. The following year, 1890, he accordingly spends from February to the end of April in Poland, and at the start of May, he sets off for the Congo. He's in Africa from early June until early December. When he arrives in Kinshasa in early August, he discovers that the Florida, his anticipated command, was wrecked in July. When the captain of the Roi des Belges falls ill in early September, Kozinovsky takes over for the return trip from Stanley Falls. This return trip included taking on board a sick company agent, Georges Antoine Klein, who dies during the voyage. Kozniowski himself had been ill with dysentery at Stanley Falls, and he falls ill again at the end of September. Conrad later told his wife how he'd nearly died from dysentery while being carried to the coast when he left the Congo. He was still ill when he returned to Europe. He spent most of March 1891 in the German hospital in London, where he was diagnosed with malaria, rheumatism, and neuralgia. Kozanyowski's six months in Africa left him with lasting health problems, but that was not the only outcome of this experience. As he puts the letter, he was a brute before he went to the Congo. His experiences there were transformative, an awakening of his consciousness, an awareness of new realities, or a new awareness of reality, perhaps. In his essay, Geography and Some Explorers, Conrad describes himself as a contemporary of the Great Lakes, that is, a contemporary of the European exploration and mapping of the Great Lakes of Africa, Nyasa, Tanganyika, and Victoria, by men like Richard Burton and John Hanning Speak during the 1850s. This led to what Conrad calls his first bit of map drawing, which consisted in entering laboriously in pencil the outline of Tanganyika on my beloved old atlas, he puts it. Since the atlas was published in 1852, as he explains, the heart of its Africa was white and big. As you will have noticed, Conrad transfers this experience to Marlowe in Heart of Darkness. 
He writes in there, now when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. At that time, there were many blank spaces on the earth. And when I saw one that looked particularly inviting on a map, I'd put my finger on it and say, when I grow up, I will go there. In his essay, Conrad elaborates on the attraction of these blank spaces and the unknown regions that they represented. He writes, my imagination could depict to itself there worthy, adventurous and devoted men nibbling at the edges, attacking from north and south and east and west, conquering a bit of truth here and a bit of truth there. Although he uses the language of warfare and conquest, what he clearly has in mind is the Enlightenment project of extending knowledge, which combined the aspiration for intellectual progress with the belief in the power of such progress to improve human society and individual lives. Kozanyovsky had nursed the hope that this appointment in the Congo might lead to involvement in a proposed exploring expedition. However, what he found in the Congo was something very different from what he'd imagined. We can get a measure of this from his description of the El Dorado expedition in Heart of Darkness. He compares the participants to sordid buccaneers. He says, there was not an atom of foresight or serious intention in the whole batch of them. And then he goes on to describe their motivation more precisely. To tear treasure out of the bowels of the land was their desire. There's no more moral purpose at the back of it than there is in burglars breaking into a safe. Clearly, Kozanyovsky was disillusioned by his experience in Africa. We might compare this account with those worthy, adventurous and devoted men of his childhood imagination. But the sordid motives that he saw behind this particular piece of exploration was not the worst of his discoveries. At this point, we need to take a step backwards. The context for Conrad's adventure in the Congo was what is called the Scramble for Africa, which started in the 1870s. This was the struggle between various European powers to take over parts of Africa and have access to its resources. We might think then of figures like the missionary explorer, Dr. Livingstone, who died in Ilala in 1873, and whose body was brought home for a hero's funeral in Westminster Abbey. Livingstone's plan for Africa was summed up in the three C's, commerce, Christianity, and civilization. Livingston opened up Central Africa for missionaries through the university's Mission to Central Africa, founded in 1860, and opened it up for trade through the Livingstonia Central Africa Company, founded in 1877, which was renamed the African Lakes Company Limited in 1878, one of those limited companies that were developed in Britain in the 19th century. This was a Glasgow-based commercial operation which developed political ambition, ambitions in the 1880s. A young journalist who famously found Dr. Livingston, Henry Morton Stanley, through an expedition funded by the New York Herald, gives us a clearer insight into what this civilizing mission, with its public promotion of commerce, Christianity, and civilization, meant in practice. After this coup of finding Livingston, Stanley returned to Europe in a blaze of publicity. Stanley was not only an adept self-publicist, as his various books and his continuing fame suggests, but he was also the subject of public controversy, which is often forgotten. In 1872, he was involved in a dispute with the Royal Geographical Association over what was felt to be his attempt to appropriate Livingston's reputation. Stanley had not only found Livingston, he'd also been entrusted, like Marlowe in relation to Kurtz, with Livingston's private journals and letters. If Stanley promoted Livingston's reputation, he also associated himself with this revived renown. Thus, in 1874, when Livingston's pickled body finally reached England, Stanley was one of the pallbearers at Westminster Abbey. Later that year, he returned to Africa on an expedition commissioned by the New York Herald and co-sponsored in Britain by the Daily Telegraph to travel from Zanzibar to Boma in the Congo. That is traveling from the east to the uh, westwards. The controversy this time was roused by his newspaper account of a violent incident on Bambira Island in Lake Victoria. He'd taken revenge for an earlier slight when the inhabitants of this island had refused him food. Putting down the inhabitants. As the Saturday Review observed, he has no concern with justice, no right to administer it. He comes with no sanction, no authority, no jurisdiction, nothing but explosive bullets and a copy of the Daily Telegraph. 
We might think of Kurtz, who came among his peoples, quote, with thunder and lightning. Godly powers, which are explained for us in a few, a few pages later as two shotguns, a heavy rifle, and a light revolver carbine. The thunderbolts of that pitiful Jupiter. In Stanley's case, it was not just that he'd used excessive force that stirred up the controversy. It was also the ruthless nature of the force and the apparent enjoyment of that ruthlessness in his published account. The Royal Geographical Society reopened the controversy when Stanley returned to England in 1878. The issue was the gap between Stanley's claims of high moral purpose and his actual practice of what he called exploration by warfare. He'd written in his diary about his hope to succeed Livingston in opening up Africa to the shining light of Christianity. But in Through the Dark Continent, um, one of the books he wrote about his explorations, he'd argued that Africans respected only force, power, boldness and decision. The gap between the claims of high moral purpose and the practices of violence and exploitation obviously have a direct relevance to Heart of Darkness. As Norman Sherry observed long ago, when Korzeniowski went up the Congo in May 1890, he could not have been unaware of Stanley. In January 1889, for example, Stanley announced the success of his last expedition, the rescue of Emin Pasha, and throughout that summer, further news of his expedition continued to be published in the press. This was the summer Korzeniowski spent in London after his return from Australia and the year that ended with Conrad's interview in Brussels. In Geography and Some Explorers, Conrad describes his state of mind when he finally reached Stanley Falls. He didn't feel a sense of excitement or achievement. Instead, a great melancholy descended on him as he realized that the idealized realities of a boy's daydream had been displaced and befouled by the activities of Stanley and the Congo Free State. Or as he put it, by the unholy recollection of a prosaic newspaper stunt and the distasteful knowledge of the vilest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the history of human conscience and geographical exploration. Section two in Darkest Africa. If Stanley met criticism in England, he received a very different response from Belgium. In his journey to England in 1878, he'd been met by secret emissaries from Queen Victoria's cousin, King Leopold, at Marseille railway station. Two years earlier, Leopold had been impressed by a report on African exploration in the Times. This described the interior of Africa as a country of unspeakable riches with an abundance of minerals, including gold, copper, iron, and silver, just waiting for an enterprising capitalist to take the matter in hand. The cash-strapped Leopold had, had an interest in colonialism since the 1850s and had developed a very clear vision of how it might operate. As Neil Acheson put it, in colonialism for Leopold meant the very limited science of using technologically less developed populations to produce wealth from the natural resources of their own country. In the Congo, these natural resources included ivory, on which hard came increasing automobiles and their pneumatic tires, just as today it means cobalt and copper, essential for lithium batteries, electric cars and electronic devices. Leopold had also realized from reading about what was called the Java system used in the Dutch colony in Malaysia that forced labor was an even cheaper mode of production than paid labor. In 1876 then, Leopold had announced his moral crusade. To open to civilization, the only part of our globe where it has yet to penetrate, to pierce the darkness which envelops whole populations, it's a crusade worthy of this century of progress, he wrote. And I'm contrasting that with a much earlier statement by Plutarch about imposing civilization upon other peoples. It was in this context that he approached Stanley. And by the autumn of 1878, Stanley had agreed to serve Leopold in Africa for the next five years. The philanthropical and scientific mission was to open up Africa under the auspices of Leopold's Asso International Association for, the Exploration and for Exploration and Civilization. And to do this through a road in Nepal. The covert plan, as, quick, as Stanley quickly realized, was to make the Congo Basin a Belgian colony. Or more precisely, the plan was to make a colony managed by a series of companies like that um, the Society Anonyme Belge, which employed Kozunovsky, 
companies in which Leopold was the principal shareholder. In King Leopold's Ghost, Adam Hochschild provides a detailed account of the operation of these companies and of the means by which the local peoples were compelled to provide free labor. This involved the use of African mercenaries to enforce control. In 1888, these were formally organized into the Force Publique as an army for Leopold's new state. As Hochschild says, the Force Publique constituted an army of occupation, counter guerrilla troops to put down opposition, and a corporate labor police, police force. By the end of the century, it had grown to more than 19,000 officers, officers and men. They encouraged productivity through hostage taking, through the cutting off of hands, noses and ears, and through beheadings. This was the reality of colonialism that Conrad encountered in Africa. There are traces of it in the account of the Grove of Death in Heart of Darkness, but Conrad had, like Marlowe, signed a confidentiality agreement. And this confidentiality agreement was something that Leopold's lawyers took very seriously. It's a letter, the worst of these practices. Instead, we have the picture of the file of black men that Marlowe encounters. They were called, called criminals, he observed skeptically. Each had an iron collar on his neck and all were connected together with a chain. Behind them is what he calls one of the reclaimed, the product of the new forces at work, in a uniform jacket with all button off and carrying a rifle by its middle. This is presumably a member of the force publique, and this man greets the emissary of light with a rascally grin that seemed to Marlowe, that seemed to take Marlowe, quote, into the partnership in his exalted trust, and exchange that Marlowe registers as a mark of his complicity. The third section is called Annexing Malaysia. So far I've talked about Africa, but I want to go back to the summer of 1889 when Korzeniowski sat down at his table after the breakfast dishes were cleared away and began work on his first novel, Almeida's Folly. He recalls that moment in a personal record where he writes, unknown to my respectable landlady, it was my practice directly after my breakfast to hold animated receptions of Malays, Arabs and half castes. They did not clamor aloud for my attention. They came with silent, an irresistible appeal. Although he begins by mentioning Almea and then his wife and daughter, he builds up to this picture of what he calls the Pantai Band, the multiracial community of Zambia, as the ghosts who haunt him and supplicate their fictional recreation. In his author's notes to Almea's Folly, which he'd hoped to have published with the novel in 1895, but which didn't actually appear, Conrad defends a literature that deals with strange people and far off countries by asserting that his sense of a bond between us and that humanity so far away. He concludes this note with what's a consciously, explicitly anti-racist affirmation. I am content to sympathize with common mortals, no matter where they live, in houses or in huts, in the streets under a fog or in the forests behind the dark line of dismal mangroves that fringe the vast solitude of the sea. Or one of the early reviews, sorry, one of the early reviews talked of Conrad annexing Malaysia to English literature. But this was something of a misreading of the work's politics. If Conrad is appropriating this East Borneo riverine community in his early fiction, he's also giving full voice to the difference to the different cultures involved there. The novel begins with the words Kaspar Makan, Kaspar, a Dutch name, Makan, um, a Malay word as Almea, Kaspar Almea, born in Batavia to Dutch parents, is summoned to dinner in Malay by his Sulu wife, for whom Malay is actually a second language. The novel ends with the Arab trader Abdullah breathing out piously the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. In between, Conrad notes British interest in what is nominally Dutch colonial space, in European terms at least, while also demonstrating Arab trading ne networks and various local territorial claims. In particular, he gives voice to Sulu grievances with the English and the Dutch. Within Almea's home, Mrs. Almea provides a kind, produces a kind of monotonous recitative describing the glories of the Sultan of Sulu, his great splendor, his power, his great prowess, the fear which benumbed the hearts of white men at the sight of his swift piratical prowess. While their daughter Nina 
listens to the story of deeds valorous, albeit somewhat bloodthirsty, where men of her mother's race shone far above the Orang Blander, that is the, the Dutch, the white men. In the end, after her experience of racial prejudice in Singapore, this is the heritage that she chooses. She asserts then, I have been rejected with scorn by the white people, and now I am a Malay. Meanwhile, Almea is shown clinging onto his pride in his identity as a white man, even though it loses him his daughter. On a less domestic novel, the main strand of the narrative is built around Dain Marula's need for gunpowder to protect Bali against the Dutch, while the Aceh war against the Dutch in Sumatra rumbles on in the background. The novel shows an unsuccessful white man of Dutch descent, even master in his own household, while also registering another politics which contests European colonization, which can be seen from a retrospective perspective as the start of an anti-colonial struggle. I've also mentioned Nina Almeida's experience of racial prejudice in Singapore. When the Dutch naval officers visit Almeida, Nina responds angrily to the lieutenant's approach to her, showing her understanding of the racial and gender dynamics in play. She says, I hate the sound of your gentle voices. That's the way you speak to women, dropping sweet words before any pretty face. In Conrad's second novel, An Outcast of the Islands, which is a prequel to Almer's Folly, set in the same Borneo settlement, but some dozen years earlier, Conrad similarly allows Babalacci to present the perspective of the oppressed, of the oppressed other in his conversation with Lingard in part four, chapter two. When Lingard states that when he spoke to the Raja Patalolo, he spoke like an elder brother for your good. Babalachi, who's a survivor of James Brooks, quote, war against the pirates, that is the war against the Sulu empire, rejects this contemporary colonialist discourse. He replies bitterly, this is white man's talk. That's how you all talk while you load your guns and sharpen your swords. And when you're ready, then to those who are weak, you say, obey me and be happy or die. And he goes on, you are strange, you white men. You think it's only your wisdom and your virtue and your happiness that are true. This is an even more unsettling challenge, I think, to the European reader. Here and elsewhere in his Malay fiction, Conrad directly challenges his readers' conventional beliefs and epistemological assumptions through his cross-cultural and inherently relativistic representations. I want to move now to part four, an outpost of progress, and I want now to return to Africa. And I want to begin this with the lesser known of Conrad's two African stories. That is the short story, An Outpost of Progress. This was written in July 1896, when the Conrads were on their honeymoon in Brittany and published in the magazine Cosmopolis in June and July of 1897. By way of comparison, Heart of Darkness was begun two years later in December 1898 and finished in February 1899. In his 1919 author's note to Tales of Unrest, the collection in which an outpost of progress was included, Conrad described this story as the lightest part of the loot that he carried off from Central Africa. What I hope to show now is how this statement has perhaps led to an underestimation of this particular short story. I want to cite two other statements at this stage as evidence of a more favorable judgment of the story on Conrad's part. The first is a short note he wrote in 1906, when an outpost of progress was republished in Grand Magazine. The note was headed, My Best Story and Why I Think So. The elements he singles out for praise are the scrupulous unity of tone, which he aimed at when writing the story, and the well-remembered severity of discipline to which he subjected himself. The difficulty, he says, not because of what I had to write, but what I had firmly made up my mind not to write into it. What he left out is perhaps suggested by the letter he wrote to T. Fisher Unwin, the publisher of Cosmopolis, the magazine in which an outpost of progress appeared. He wrote to Unwin in late July, 1896, shortly after he'd finished the story, to tell him something about, about the story he was going to send him. Perhaps the most interesting part of this letter is his reflection on the process of writing the story. He writes, all the bitterness of those days, all my puzzled wonder as to the meaning of all I saw, all my indignation at masquerading philanthropy have been with me again while I wrote. This bitterness 
and indignation or what he felt he had to subject to that severity of discipline in order to achieve his artistic purpose. He faced a similar problem later when writing about anarchists in The Secret Agent and Russian revolutionaries in Under Western Eyes. In The Secret Agent, as in An Outpost of Progress, one of the devices he used as part of that discipline was a sustained ironic tone. In Under Western Eyes, by comparison, one of the devices he used there was to have an elderly English language teacher as his narrator, a man whose nationality and limited knowledge of Russians created the distance that Conrad needed for subject matter that was personally disturbing to him because of its closeness. And he adopts a similar device with Marlowe in Heart of Darkness. The other detail from that letter to Unwin, to which I want to draw your attention at this stage, is his outline of the story. He writes, the story is simple. There's hardly any description. The most common incidents are related. The life in a lonely station on the Kasai. I've divested myself of everything but pity and some scorn while putting down the insignificant events that bring on the catastrophe. Upon my word, I think it's a good story. The Kasai is a tributary of the Congo. It begins in central Angola and runs into the Congo northeast of Kinshasa. For much of its length, it now forms the boundary between Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. But what I want to note in the passage I've just quoted is that there's no mention of the characters. There's no mention of whose story this is. And this is where I turn to the next section, Kayat and Collier. Early post-war criticism of this story tended to focus on the two Europeans, Kayat and Collier. Jocelyn Baines, for example, in his groundbreaking 1960 critical biography, describes the subject of the story as the rapid disintegration of two white traders, average products of the machine of civilization, when confronted with the corroding power of solitude and the unusual. Similarly, Ian Watt, in his influential Conrad in the 19th century, stated that the plot concerns two average lower middle class Belgians who, who go out to the Congo to get rich. An outburst of progress can indeed be read, as Baines and Watt suggest, as a sardonic, Maupassant like story, which anatomizes the inadequacy of, inadequacies of Kayats and Carlier, and through them mocks the idea of the civilizing mission. We know from Conrad's friend and collaborator, Ford Maddox Ford, that Conrad was a great admirer of Guy de Maupassant's short stories, and indeed knew, knew some of them at least by heart. In 1904, he wrote a preface for a volume of Maupassant's stories, translated by Ford's wife, Elsie, in which he refers to his long and intimate acquaintance with Maupassant's work. In an outpost of progress, Conrad presents us with two European men, Caius and Carlier, one a bureaucrat, a government clerk, the other an ex-soldier. Conrad used the names of the two Belgians he met in the Congo, and though Belgium is never named in the story, their names reflect the two main linguistic communities of which Belgium is composed, the French-speaking minority and the Dutch-speaking Flemish community. Caius and Carlier are introduced as sorry, two perfectly insignificant and incapable individuals whose existence is only rendered possible through the high organization of civilized crowds. And we might note that word incapable and note also that reference to the high organization of civilized crowds. Kayats has come to Africa to earn a dowry for his daughter. Cartier has been sent to Africa because he'd made himself so obnoxious to his family by his laziness and impudence, we're told. Their vision of their task is, as they put it, to sit still and gather in the ivory those savages will bring. Both men are so institutionalized, so dependent on the support of a surrounding crowd of like-thinking men, as to be incapable of independent thought or action. Thus, Kayats is filled with nostalgia for his life as a government clerk back in Europe. He regretted the streets, the pavements, the cafes, his friends of many years, all the things he used to see day after day, all the thoughts suggested by familiar things. Carlier is similarly nostalgic for his old life as a soldier. He regretted the clink of sabre and spurs on a fine afternoon, the barrackroom witticisms, the girls of garrison towns. For both men, Africa is a void, a blank. The river, the forests, all the great land throbbing with life were like a great emptiness. That reference to all the great land throbbing with life carefully marks the narrator's distance from the two Europeans, for whom the great land is, as I've said, simply a great emptiness. If this latter is a version of the imperial gaze, dehistoricizing and erasing the human presence from the colonized landscape, then that gaze here is presented explicitly as the product of stupidity and laziness, 
rather than as an expression of power. The great emptiness of Africa in this instance very clearly reflects a lack on the part of the viewer. In the course of the story, there's one brief moment when Kayats and Carlier gain a sense of purpose. This is when they come across an article in an old newspaper called, an article called Our Colonial Expansion. Its rhetoric allows them briefly to think better of themselves. It spoke much of the rights and duties of civilization, of the sacredness of the civilizing work, and extolled the merits of those who went about bringing light and faith and commerce to the dark places of the earth. As readers, we're very conscious of the gap between this rhetoric and the character and activities, or rather lack of activities in this case, of the two representatives of the civilizing mission in this story. And this is emphasized when Carlier tries to imagine the civilization that they'll bring to this particular dark place. Here, the inadequacy of his imaginings serves to subvert their self-regard and the official rhetoric of civilizing work. He thinks, he thinks in a hundred years, there will perhaps be a town here, keys and warehouses and barracks and, and billiard rooms, civilization, my boy, and virtue. Carlyle's vision, sorry, Carlier's vision of civilization exhausts itself after this brief enumeration of warehouses and keys, barracks and billiard rooms. His recent experience of keys and warehouses, which he must have glimpsed on his way to this outpost of progress, combined with his memories of the barracks and billiard rooms of his former life, for which he feels nostalgic. In the meantime, while they wait for the ivory to come in, they're almost entirely dependent on the friendship of Gabula, the chief of the neighboring villagers, and the food brought to them by Gabula's people. As the next paragraph informs us, in consequence of that friendship, the women of Gabula's village walked in single file through the reedy grass, bringing every morning to the station fowls and sweet potatoes and palm wine, and sometimes a goat. The company never provisions the stations fully, and the agents required those local supplies to live. So far from bringing light to the dark places of the earth, Kayats and Kale are shown to be parasitic on the existing economy, the existing social organization of the African location. With the arrival of a knot of armed men, the slave traders from the coast, the imperialist rhetoric of civilized and savage receives a further knock. The leader, we're told, stood in front of the veranda and made a long speech. He gesticulated much and ceased very suddenly. For readers of Heart of Darkness, the scene is curiously reminiscent of Marlowe's speech with gestures to his bearers, but with the significant difference, of course, that this speech is made by an African, and more importantly, seems to be addressed by an African to Europeans. For Kayats and Carlier, the experience is inexplicably unsettling. There was something in his intonation, in the sounds of his, the long sentences he used that startled the two whites. It was like a reminiscence of something not exactly familiar and yet resembling the speech of civilized men. The narrator has emphasized that Kayats and Carlier are psychologically dependent on the safety of the familiar, as we've seen in the passages I quoted earlier. Here, however, the discovery of the familiar and the unexpected is unwelcome, and the involuntary memory it produces is disconcerting. We might see this mixture of the familiar and the unexpected as an instance of what Freud calls the uncanny. More importantly, what Kayats and Kali are experiencing in this moment is an undermining of the categories, the binary oppositions of imperialist rhetoric, which they've imposed on their experience of Africa. The contradictions they were able to ignore in their relations with the friendly Gubilla are now inescapable. Were they felt able to dismiss the other Africans they've dealt with as, quote, savages and, quote, animals, the arrival of this particular group forces on them a recognition of authority and culture, which undermines their simple, civilized, savage binary. It's interesting that Collier's amazed response to this linguistic performance is the observation, I fancied the fellow was going to speak French. Although he immediately turns to dismiss the leader's language as a different kind of gibberish to what we've ever heard. For a brief moment, he's forced to accept an equivalence between the two languages and to experience a corresponding disruption of his expectations. The next section is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Price. I could go further with his analysis of the story in terms of the two Europeans, their disintegration and their breakdown. But what I want to do now is use the entry of this knot of armed men to change the direction of, the, of this lecture. I want to start with the detailed description the narrator gives of them. We're told, they were strangers to that part of the country. They were tall, slight, 
draped classically from neck to heel in blue fringe cloths and carried percussion muskets over their bare right shoulders. In his Malay fictions, Conrad describes the dress of the different peoples of the archipelago with an ethnographer's accuracy. And I'm sure that this detailed description could be decoded by someone with more knowledge of the peoples of Africa than I have to identify precisely who these men are. The percussion muskets are a major source of their power and authority. We might recall the Kurtz got the tribe to follow him because he came to them with thunder and lightning, that is, with superior weaponry. The Africans that ambush Marlow's steamer upriver are armed with spears and bows and arrows, but these strangers are carrying percussion muskets. Percussion muskets were introduced from the 1820s. They're distinctly old fashioned compared to the Martini Henry rifles carried by Marlow's colleagues on the steamer. Conrad's African fictions document this hierarchy of weaponry in the context of trade and power relations in the region that he visited. As Conrad said approvingly in his essay on Maupassant, facts and again facts are his unique concern. I want to argue in this section of the lecture that an outpost of progress is very carefully grounded in the cultural diversity of Africa, in just the way we've seen in the contrast between the Gubilis people and these armed strangers. In addition, I want to argue that Henry Price and his wife, not the Europeans, are the central figures in the narrative. Their ability to negotiate between and manipulate the different cultures of Europe and Africa is the pivot on which the narrative turns. I could go into this in more detail, but perhaps I should skip over this and move, more, move towards the conclusion. What do you think, Wojtek? There's more de there is more detail, but perhaps I should cut that short. What do you see? Should I carry on or jump, jump, move on? So, um, Conrad's registering of the cultural diversity of Africa begins in the Price household. In this station on the Kasai, Price is from Sierra Leone to the north, while his wife is from Luanda in Angola to the west. Luanda, as it happens, is one of the oldest colonial cities in Africa, founded by the Portuguese in 1576. And I'll come back to Sierra Leone in a moment. The first point then is that neither of them is native to this region. The second point is that in addition to this mixed household, the story involves four distinct groups of Africans, the local people, people from the surrounding villages, the men who arrived by canoe to trade, the armed strangers from the coast, and the 10 station men left by the director. As we've seen, the local people are represented as an efficiently functioning society. The women seem to be in charge of cultivation and the relations with Kayat and Kalye are determined by Gubilla, the chief of the neighboring villages. Some attempt is made to represent Gubilla's mental processes and cross-cultural perspective. And the cross-cultural perspective is briefly reversed as the Europeans become the object of Gubilla's gaze. The strangers from the coast, the knot of armed men, are de very different from Gabilis people and very different from the men with spears who arrived by canoe to trade. These men who arrived by canoe are described as naked, glossy black, ornamented with snowy shells and glistening brass wire, perfect of limb. They moved in a stately manner and sent quick wild glances out of their startled, never resting eyes. They're clearly nervous in these surroundings and they squat in long rows four or more deep before the veranda while their chiefs bargain for hours with Mokola over an, elephant, over an elephant tusk. The strangers from the coast, as we've seen, carry firearms and not spears. They're not naked, but draped classically from neck to heel in blue fringe cloths, and they arrive on foot, not by canoe. Apart from these signs of their cultural difference, the most striking characteristic of these strangers is that they're not in awe of the Europeans. I've already referred to the speech that they address, the leader addresses to Kayat and Carlier. When it becomes apparent to him that they don't understand him, he addresses himself then to Henry Price and turns his attention from the, from the Europeans on the veranda to the Price's hut. For the remainder of their stay in this settlement on the station, the two Europeans are ignored and to the horror of Kayats and Carlier, these strangers were told made themselves at home on the station. The fourth group, the 10 station men, had been brought from a very distant part of the land of darkness and sorrow. They were engaged by the company for six months, but have served for upwards of two years. They can't run away because as wandering strangers, they'd be killed by the inhabitants of the country. They're represented as having a different culture from the local people, which causes them further problems. The rice rations served out by the company did not agree with them, being a food unknown to their land. 
and to which they could not get used. Consequently, they were unhealthy and miserable. Where the company in its provision of rations homogenizes African cultures, Conrad's narrative very carefully distinguishes distinct cultural groups. The station men, like the local people, were also represented as belonging to a functioning community. They were not happy, regretting the, the festive incantations, the sorceries, the human sacrifices of their own land, where they also had parents, brothers, sisters, admired chiefs, respected magicians, loved friends, and other ties supposed generally to be human. The initial reference to incantations, sorceries, human sacrifices presents them as other and accords with stereotypical expectations and representations of the African as savage. But the subsequent reference to parents, brothers, sisters immediately breaks down the distance between them and the reader. The final words, ties generally supposed to be human, effectively thematizes the issue of sameness and difference. And these words prompt the reader towards a sense of common humanity within cultural diversity. And this is reinforced sublimely by the echo of the regrets of Kayats and Carlier for their old life, which prompts an awareness of the similar nostalgia, the similar homesickness expressed here. These Africans in Africa feel as homesick for their distant community as the two Europeans. In short, where Kayats and Carlier experience Africa as a void, a great emptiness, the narrative intimates that that space is actually filled with a range of functioning cultures and communities. And where the company homogenizes Africa, the narrative is careful to distinguish and differentiate a range of cultures. And this brings me to the place of language or rather languages in an outpost of progress. When Henry Price is first introduced, it's observed that he spoke English and French with a warbling accent. It's not quite clear from this whether he speaks both languages or just French with a warbling accent. In addition, it's clear from the narrative that he must also speak or at least understand some African languages since he negotiates with the people who bring in the ivory. When the armed strangers arrive, he's obviously anxious. He shows signs of excitement and leaves the storehouse in order to meet the visitors. But he also claims not to understa understand their language when questioned by Kayats, although he clearly has some understanding of it since he responds to the leader when addressed by him. This is the series of exchanges. Hey, Makola, what does he say? Where do they come from? Who are they? But Makola, who seemed to be standing on hot bricks, answered hurriedly, I don't know. They come from very far. Pat Mrs. Price will understand. The leader, after waiting for a while, said something sharply to Makola, who shook his head. The implication of this last exchange is that Price understands, but doesn't speak the visitor's language. Mrs. Price, for her part, both understands and speaks the language. We're told that the next moment, Mrs. Makola was heard speaking with great volubility. And Price subsequently describes the visitor to the Europeans as traders from Luanda. There's ambiguity about this formulation of traders from Luanda. Does it mean that they have just come from Luanda or that they're originally from Luanda? Similarly, when they're referred to as from the coast, does this mean the west coast or the east coast? Would Luanda count as very far from Napos on the Kasai? The slave trade in Luanda was abolished in 1836, whereas the trade in slaves continued in Zanzibar until the end of the century. Tipu Tib, to whom Conrad refers in Geography and Some Explorers, was the best known slave trader in Africa, trading slaves and ivory from the Congo to Zanzibar. Between 1884 and 1887, he was the protector of Zanzibar's interests in the Congo. In 1887, with the Sultan of Zanzibar's permission, he was made governor of the Stanley Falls region by Stanley a position he held until his retirement in 1890 or 1891, representing both Stanley and Zanzibar. If the traders were born or based in Luanda, they could have spoken with Mrs. Price in Portuguese or in one of the Bantu languages, Kimbundu, Umbundu or Kikongo. Mrs. Price's language skills, if they'd been listed like her husband's, would have included some of these languages together with whatever was the language she shared with her husband. While Mrs. Price engages in dialogue with the strangers, Price seems to lose his linguistic skills altogether. We get the following. When questioned by the white man, he was very strange, seemed not to understand, seemed to have forgotten French, seemed to have forgotten how to speak altogether. The implication obviously is that Price at this point doesn't want to communicate with the Europeans. Because of the danger posed by this group of armed men, he wants to exclude the Europeans from the negotiations taking place with these traders from Luanda. Through their linguistic skills, through the different languages they speak, Mr. and Mrs. Price can communicate with both these dangerous strangers and with the Europeans. And they can also exclude the Europeans from the dialogue if they wish. 
I've been referring to this pivotal African character as Henry Price, but it won't have escaped your notice that in many of the passages I've quoted, he's referred to as Mokola. Even the entry in Oxford Reader's Companion to Conrad refers to him as Mokola. The story begins by noting that the name Mokola had been given to him by the natives down the river and had stuck to him in all his wanderings, but that he maintained that his name was Henry Price. The opening paragraphs also note that he's from Sierra Leone, as I've said, and the history of Sierra Leone supports his claim to, to the name Henry Price. Sierra Leone was established by the British as a homeland for freed African-American and West Indian slaves. The first settlement, Granville Town, was set up in 1787 by the London-based Committee for the Relief of the Black Poor. These being Black Poor in London, who were going to be moved to Africa. The second settlement, the Freetown Colony, was established in 1792 for Nova Scotia settlers. Again, these were um, uh, Black people who were in, in Nova Scotia. The majority of these early settlers were, in fact, Black loyalists. That is, African-Americans who'd fought on the British side the losing side in the American War of Independence, and who had subsequently lived in poverty in London or had lived in the harsh conditions of Nova Scotia. Many of these Nova Scotia settlers were Methodists, and they set up an electoral system in Freetown Colony that included votes for adult women. After the abolition of the international slave trade in 1807, the population was further increased by what were called recaptives, men and women largely from West Africa who'd been liberated from illegal slave ships. They were forced to adapt to the Western styles of the settlement and to adopt Western names. In 1820, uh, there's, there's much more about Sierra Leone. For example, the British established Fura Bay College in Freetown, the first Western style college in Sub-Sahara Africa and Sierra Leone became the educational center for British West Africa. After the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885, the British colonial government based in Freetown decided to recruit more British citizens for administrative posts, and they pushed the Sierra Leoneans out of these positions in, in the colonial administration. The effect of this was to create a diaspora of educated Sierra Leoneans who went, then moved down the west coast of Africa. Henry Price can be seen as part of this diaspora. I'm going to, there's a lot more about Henry Price, which I'll skip over, which I can come back to later. What I want to move to now, what I want to emphasize is the way in which Henry Price is a pivotal figure in this narrative. Um, but I will, I'll leave the details of that and move on towards my concluding sections. So what I want to move towards the end then is, is Heart of Darkness. An outpost of progress presents a powerful challenge to the rhetoric of the civilizing mission that promoted colonization. Like Conrad's early MLA fiction, it doesn't show heroic white men dominating their colonized worlds, but rather weak and incapable individuals. It doesn't show noble motives of colonization, but rather the desire to make money, as in the case of Kayots, or else individuals who've been packed off to the colonies by their family, as in the case of Carlier. At the same time, it attends to the indigenous cultures of the region and gives voice to some of its peoples. Towards the end of the narrative, the narrator explains the delay which has left Kayots and Carlier alone together on the station for eight months. What we're told is the following. One of the company's steamers had been wrecked and the director was busy with the other, relieving very distant and important stations on the main river. This story of the wrecked steamer and the relief of stations on the main river is of course the story of Heart of Darkness. And what we have to remember is that this reference comes two years before Conrad actually wrote Heart of Darkness. More importantly, the earlier publication of An Outpost of Progress creates a context for the publication of Heart of Darkness when it arrives. Like the Malay fiction, it creates for the observant reader an expectation of a critical attitude towards colonization. These observant readers would include contemporary critics like Edward Garner and fellow writers like Robert Cunningham Graham, both friends of Conrad. When Conrad was writing Heart of Darkness, he knew it was, he was writing it for Blackwood's magazine, a very respectable and fairly conservative publication with a readership in the maritime, mercantile, and colonial services. He wrote to his agent, J.B. Pinker, there isn't a single club and mess room and man of war in the British seas and dominions which hasn't its copy of, of this magazine. This advanced knowledge of his first readers influences some of the strategies that Conrad then adopted in relation to his story. And I want to consider here just two aspects of those and how they relate to the issue of colonialism. I'll do this very quickly. First, I want to consider Conrad's use of frame narrators. Heart of Darkness begins with an unnamed frame narrator. He describes the ship, the setting, and his companions on board the Nelly. Then Conrad offers 
a beautiful paragraph describing the Thames at nightfall, in which this unnamed narrator evokes the great spirit of the past upon the low reaches of the Thames. The rhetoric of this passage would be familiar to the original magazine readers from various popular histories celebrating England's age of exploration. It had known and served all the men of whom the nation is proud, from Sir Francis Drake to Sir John Franklin, knights all, titled and untitled, the great knights errant of the sea. However, this passage is not as straightforward as it sounds. As a recent article in Blackwoods had pointed out, Sir Francis Drake could also be regarded as a pirate and a murderer. And the more recent story of Sir John Franklin was the story of a failed attempt to find the Northwest Passage, which had ended in the loss of all the men of the Erebus and the Terror after the ships were frozen in the ice, and it created rumours of cannibalism after the food supplies had run out. No wonder Marlowe then says that the glamour's off the idea of Arctic exploration. Similarly, the narrator's celebratory assertion, hunters for gold or pursuers of fame, they all have gone out on that stream, bearing the sword and often the torch, messengers of the might within the land, reveals other meanings when put under pressure. Consider first the motives ascribed to these explorers, the desire for gold or for fame, and then consider how that distinction maps onto the pilgrims at the center station, central station and onto courts at the inner station. And then notice how the word, the sword, how the sword is the instrument of exploration, while often the torch, a nod towards the civilizing mission, makes it a less essential part of these activities. The next element in this sentence, the might within the land, again makes very clear what the priority is. The nationalist and imperialist rhetoric is double-voiced in this passage, and the passage undermines itself from within. Marlowe's response to this speech, and this also has been one of the dark places of the earth, has the effect of undermining the first narrator's mood of celebration. His response picks up the colonial rhetoric of darkness and light, which the novella as a whole undermines, just as the novella destabilizes the accompanying rhetoric of civilized and savage. The phrase goes back to Psalm 74, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of violence. This passage can be used to encourage bringing Christianity to nations who don't know God. But if we think back to Livingston's three C's, commerce, Christianity, and civilization, we can see how this Im imagery of darkness and light also served to justify trade as part of that third term, civilization, and produce the civilizing mission as a moral imperative. In Marlowe's case, this, servant, this statement serves to introduce an imaginative narrative about the Romans in Britain. His account is from the perspective of a commander of a trireme. Land in a swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland post feel the savagery, the utter savagery had closed around him. It clearly anticipates his account of his own experiences in Africa as the captain of a river steamer. But that focus on the subjective experience of the colonizer, combined with the reversal of perspectives by which the Thames Valley is experienced as one of the dark places of the earth, has certain effects. First, it suggests that the perception of savagery is a function of the displacement of the observer, rather than being a true statement about the object of perception. We are made aware of the fears, investments, and psychological projections of the colonizer, and how these affect what they then experience. Secondly, this is the first of a number of occasions when Marlowe reverses the perspective in this way, and asks his readers to imagine themselves in the position of being colonized. There's also a further level, perhaps not known to Marlowe or Conrad, namely that the Romans in Britain were not necessarily Italians. Indeed, the Emperor Septimus Severus, who fought against the tribes north of Hadrian's Wall, was actually born in Libya. So that there were North Africans in Britain some centuries before the English arrived. Marlowe's historical fantasy ends with the reflection, mind, none of us would feel exactly like this. What saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. This is the first of a number of attempts by Marlowe to differentiate between the Romans and contemporary British imperialism. He goes on, there were no colonists, their administration was merely a squeeze and nothing more. We might bear this in mind when Marlowe later describes the role of the French steamer in which he travels down the African coast. We pounded along, stopped, landed soldiers, went on, landed custom house clerks to levy tolls, landed more soldiers to take care of the custom house clerks, presumably. As he draws conclusions from his historical fantasy, his account of the Roman conquest of Britain loses sight of that argument about efficiency. When he describes it as robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a great scale, the idea that efficiency could redeem this activity becomes extremely problematic. His next statement, 
the conquest of the earth, which mostly involves the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, has clearly moved away from the Romans in Britain to more recent conquests. And when he tries to justify this process by reference to the idea of the, at the back of it, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to, that row of dots is what's called an aposiopesis, a breaking off. It leads into Marlowe's story of his experiences in Africa, but it's also a trap for the reader. We must think about those original Blackwood's readers. This is the first installment of a three-part serial. Conrad wants his readers to want to carry on reading. On first sight, it looks as if Marlowe is telling a story which will reveal what the idea is that redeems colonialism. And many readers and many critics have sought for that idea as they read the rest of Marlowe's narrative. But we need to look closely at that image that Marlowe has used, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. And we need to remember that Marlowe knows how the story he's going to tell ends, even as he begins to tell it. The story he tells, then, is not the story of the idea that redeems colonialism. It's a story of the mercenary motives of almost everyone involved in the civilizing work in the Congo. And it's the story of one man who genuinely believed in the rhetoric of the civilizing mission and what became of him. Kurtz's statement about the local people that we approach them with the mitres of a deity culminates in him setting himself up as a deity to whom others bow down and offer a sacrifice. And it's this memory that prompts Marlowe's story and Marlowe's storytelling. Kurtz had observed by the simple exercise of our will, we can exert a power for good practically unbounded. But in that state of being unbounded, it's a will to power that asserts itself. And we might notice again how will, power and might mark this discourse. Marlowe's narration of Heart of Darkness then presents a very critical image of colonization and those involved in it. It's an account that emphasizes the exploitation of local peoples, their suffering and the extraction of wealth by the Europeans behind it. It presents the huge gap between the realities of colonization and what Marlowe refers to as the rot let loose in print and talk the promotion of, col of colonization by politicians and the press. It undermines the binaries that constitute the colonial discourse, darkness, light, savage, civilized, and so on. And through the figure of Kurtz, it shows how the very idea of a civilizing mission contained within it a will to power, as Petrarch suggested so many centuries earlier. We might recall here Babalacci's words also that I quoted earlier. You're strange, you white men. You think it's only your wisdom and your virtue and your happiness that are true. I want to end then with three brief points. First, Conrad draws on his own experiences in the Congo, but he also distances himself from them in this narrative through the use of two narrators, the unnamed frame narrator and Charles Marlowe, the frame narrator. This is partly, as I've suggested, to distance himself, but it's also a means of relating to his English readers. He has two Englishmen as mediators between himself and his readership. Secondly, as I've been suggesting, Marlowe's role as narrator is tentative and provisional he knows in advance how the story ends, but the process of storytelling is also his attempt to try and understand this experience. Thirdly, you will have noticed that Conrad doesn't name Brussels, Belgium, or the Congo. You might have also have noticed that on a number of occasions, Marlowe insists that he's not revealing any trade secrets. This is partly ironic in that what he reveals is something much more devastating than commercial practices, but it also suggests one of the constraints under which Conrad was working. Like Marlowe, as I've said, he probably did sign a non-disclosure document. And as I've said, Leopold's lawyers took those agreements very seriously. Fourthly, Heart of Darkness was published in 1899. This was four years before E.D. Morell published his newspaper articles exposing Leopold's practices in the Congo. Roger Casement published his report exposing the atrocities in the Congo in 1904. And the Congo Reform Society was founded in that year. I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking so long. Thank, thank you very much, Robert. Um, uh, we will now move on to uh, some uh, questions. Um, we will have uh, maybe 15, maybe about 20 minutes uh, for, for questions. Uh, if I may just very quickly. Uh, ask